that you guys joined us tonight. Excited to worship with you guys. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his heart.
generations of every nation of kingdom come. So don't let your heart be troubled. Hold your head up high, don't fear no evil. Fix your eyes on this one truth. God is madly in love with you. So take courage, hold on, be strong. Remember where hell comes from. Whoa.
We serve the God that's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That means the God that we read about in the Bible is still alive. And the same stuff that he did back then, he still does today. It's the same God that we worship tonight. Isn't that incredible? I'm calling on the God of Jacob, whose love endures through generations.
There's a name that levels mountains Carves out highways through the sea I've seen his praise unraveled battles Right in front of me There's a faith that stands defiant Sends Goliath to his knees. I've seen his praise unraveled shackles right off my feet.
God, your name is wonderful. God, help us to trust you that you are the same now as you are before we were ever born, before you laid the foundations of the earth. You loved us. God, we can trust you now and for eternity. God, we thank you for your spirit. God, invite your spirit into our lives. Help us to see the world the way that you do. God, help us to be more like Jesus. Help us to be his hands and his feet. God, we love you and we trust you, and it's in your powerful name that we pray. Amen. Take a moment to turn around and greet someone new around you. All right. Good evening. Good evening. If you haven't made it way back to your seat, looks like you have. Uh, it's good to see all of you tonight. It's great to be in the house of the Lord worshiping together. Uh, amen. Amen. If you're here to worship tonight. Amen. Okay. Okay, Saturday night. It's great to be with you, like I said a moment ago. We wanted to introduce some people to you guys this evening. Uh, this is our crew that is going to be going to the Dominican Republic this coming week on a missions trip. You can praise the Lord for that. And so they're incredibly excited. It is this Friday that they are leaving. It's on the 16th. Oh, there's one more. Yeah. This is the whole team that is going to the Dominican Republic this coming Friday. They're going to leave. They're going to be gone for nine days ministering uh, to the community there. And so what we wanted to do was invite them to be here tonight and to pray over them together. We want to invite you during this week to be praying over them. And then over during the following week when they're there doing the missions work, we want you to join us in praying over them, praying for the work of their hands. And so if you would, would you just extend a hand this evening and we're going to pray a blessing over the team tonight. Lord, we love you and we trust you. And we thank you so much uh, for these souls that are going to go uh, and do your work in the Dominican Republic. Jesus, I pray that your kingdom would come through their hands, uh, that the way that they minister to this group of people um, would be powerful, uh, and that they'd be able to have conversations about you and your spirit. They would be able to lead people to you, uh, that they would get to answer questions that people have, that they would get to serve this community well, uh, that this community would feel the love uh, that you have for them already. And so, Jesus, we thank you that you are before us, behind us, beside us, all around us, that you go before this team. You are already in the Dominican Republic, and we are just joining alongside what you're doing. So, Jesus, we just pray for uh, the hands and feet of your servants that are going there to be obedient and to do the work of your kingdom. And so, Jesus, we lift them up to you and pray deep blessing for them as they go on this trip. And so, Lord, it's in your holy, precious, and matchless name that we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you guys so much for being with us tonight. You can head back to your seats. And I do have just a few announcements for you this evening. And so, just a few things, a few ways that you can connect. Sorry, I knew that I was in your way. I stood on top of the X, and I knew I wasn't supposed to stand there, but I did. Thank you, Karen. I have, I have just a few announcements for you, great ways that you can connect here at the church, and they're all this week. They're all this week, and so clear out your calendars if you haven't already. Uh, this coming Friday evening, February 16th, you are either getting on a plane to go and serve in the Dominican Republic, or if you're married, you're going to come to the ministry kickoff for our marriage ministry, right? That's the plans that you now have for your Friday evening. Seven o'clock this coming Friday evening, we are having a mar marriage ministry event together. So we're asking you, go grab some grub, grab some food, and then come back here at 7 p.m. and meet us together for a really great time of fellowship and games together. It's going to be a great evening. I'm really looking forward to it. So February 16th, that's this coming Friday. The other two uh, ministries that I want to share about with you this evening are grief share and divorce care. And so uh, this coming week, this coming Thursday, both of these events will be launching and beginning their next 
rotation. And so if you know someone who is walking through grief or if you are walking through grief, uh, Grief Share is a really amazing group of people that's uh, designed around uh, biblical understanding and encouragement together uh, to walk through a really difficult time. Uh, if grief is something that you're walking through, we want to see you supported and we want to see everybody in our community supported as they walk through grief. And so Thursday evening and afternoon are our Grief Share opportunities to join a group. You can join, it's Thursday evenings from 6 to 8 or in the afternoon, it's from 1 to 3 p.m. You can sign up for either of those sessions. They're open to you. And then the other is Divorce Care, which also begins February 15th, Thursday from 6 to 8 p.m. And so if that's something you are walking through or have walked through, we want to see you have support in that end as well. So you can sign up for any one of these ministries and things going on. You can't sign up to go to the Dominican this week. Sorry, sign us for that. Have closed. But you can sign up for anything else at the Connect Center right out here or through our website online. And so the last thing I wanted to share with you is is giving. So there are many ways to give here at Fellowship of the Rockies. They're all on the screen right here. But it's just another way that you join with the ministry uh, that we're doing. The Dominican Republic Missions Trip, Divorce Care, Grief Share, all of these resources that we're putting together, they only work through the generous giving. And so we thank you so much for joining with us at that. We're going to continue with our worship service through the opening of God's Word. Hey, everybody. How are you? Good. Well, sign up for the marriage deal. I'm a little bit nervous about the whole kickoff because uh, uh, Karen signed us up. Um, Karen and I are going to take part in a newlywed game on Friday night, and so I'm a little nervous about that and my answers. And so, uh, so we'd love to see you here as we kick off a, a marriage uh, ministry here at Fellowship of the Rockies. If you have your Bibles, electronic devices, and uh, you can either click to or turn to, if you'd like, to Philippians chapter 2. Uh, verses 19 through 30. We're going back a couple of verses. We're catching a couple of verses that we looked at l last week. And then we're extending that in. So you can click to or turn to uh, the scriptures if you have them on an iPad, a tablet, a phone, old school uh, Bible, you know, something like that. Or you can just follow along on the screens as they come up. We've been in this series uh, called The Power of Unity. And so last week, we looked at how my heart plays into this issue of unity. And this weekend, we're going to look at how my relationships play into this issue of unity. And, and so when I talk about unity, I'm truly talking about those intimate friends, the, the one to five friends that maybe you would develop through a lifetime that you would call an intimate friend, a close friend, something like that, but also a larger circle as as well. And so we want to look at this issue of how to develop healthy relationships in your life. And, and sometimes when you look at texts like this, you look at scriptures like this, it's a lot easier to preach and it's a lot easier to listen to than it is to actually live. Because honestly, there, this is hard work. And there's no guarantee that you will develop deep friends in the one to five range over a lifetime because it takes two people. It takes two people to participate. But we want to look at what the scripture has to say about this issue of relationships and close friends because all of us, regardless of who we are, we all need healthy friends. We all need good friends around us. Uh, this happens to be Super Bowl weekend that us Cowboys and Bronco fans are trying to forget about, right? I, uh, I, 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 I am politically connect, uh, correct tonight. Uh, I'm a little bit San Francisco and a little bit Kansas City Chiefs. You cannot even tell who I'm rooting for. And so, uh, so I just thought I would do that. And so, uh, but, you, but, but over Super Bowl weekend, if you listen to any of the interviews or anything, you start listening to these players. And all these players in their interviews, they're telling you about friends and families. They're, they're telling you that, you know what? I wouldn't be here today unless it was with, from a mom, because of a mom or because of a dad, because of a coach or because of, because of friends. And then you look at Christian McCaffrey and, and Kyle Shanahan, and they're showing the 1999 pictures of the 99 Super Bowl. When their dads were at the Super Bowl, one was a coach, uh, Mike Shanahan, and Ed McCaffrey was a player, and, and Christian and, and, and Kyle were there like running around on the field, and they would talk about being lifelong friends. And then you can look at uh, Patrick Mahomes and, and Travis Kelsey, and they're starting to talk about their relationship and how they would say, you know what, we're like on the save, same wavelength. We played so much time together. We've done so much life together that we almost know what the other one's thinking, even even before the other one acts in that way. And so when you look at this, you realize that friendships matter. 
And friendships matter deeply because there's a lot of people that will tell you, you know what, I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't because of friends and it wasn't because of close relationships. And, and when you look at Scripture, you realize that God never designed us to do life alone. Ecclesiastes, Solomon is writing, and here's what he writes about relationships. He says, two are better than one because they have good reward for their efforts. For if either falls, his companion can lift him up, but pity the one who falls without a friend, without somebody to lift them up. Also, if two lie down together, they can keep warm, but how can one person alone? How can one person alone keep warm? And if someone overpowers one person, two can resist him. A cord of three stands, it strands is not, is not easily, it's not easily broken. And so when you look at this, you realize friendships matter. I mean, you can hang around church, or you can hang around Christians for any length of time, and, and many of them will tell you, you know what, I wouldn't be here without my friends. I went through a crisis. I went through a, a problem. I went through a struggle in my life, and, and it was a close Christian friend, or it was a life group, or it was a Bible study. There were some people that came alongside of me. And so when you look at this, uh, you realize that there's a way to develop relationships with you. Uh, with, with, around you. And so tonight, I want to look at the life of the Apostle Paul. And, and we pick up the story when he was in a really low place in his life. He was, he was down. He was in prison. Uh, he was away from home. He had been in prison for about two years, and it would end. It would end in his execution. And Paul is surrounded at a low point in his life with loyal friends and loyal relationships. And, and one man once went all the way through Scripture. It's interesting to read about, but he went through Scripture and he highlighted, he, he noted all the relationships and all the friends that the Apostle Paul recommended or talked about in the Scriptures, and it's well over a hundred names. The Apostle Paul noted about being a relationship and being a friend and being a deep person, and in this passage... He talks about two of the closest friends, some intimate friends that he has, Timothy and uh, Epaphroditus. And, and he talks about them, and he talks about the support that, that, that they had given him. And a lot of times there's some misunderstanding about Paul. Paul uh, some people say, well, Paul was type A, and he was hardcore, and he was rough, and, and he, he wasn't very emotional and all of those things. And, and some of those things are true. But also when you look at Paul's life, he always focused on the other person. And you can tell that he cared, and he cared about the people around him. And, and so all of a sudden you realize why Paul was so effective in ministry, because people around him mattered greatly to him. So this, this evening I want to give you four things. I want to give you four things. If, if you want to develop healthy friends around you, especially within your close circle of friends, in your intimate friends, to where if you want to develop them, these this are the four things that you do. It's, it's, I know it's four points. Normally I have three. It's really 3.2 points because one is really quick. How's that? And so here we go. So the first one is this. If you want to develop healthy friends around you, you have to cultivate a, genu a genuine interest in others. You have to develop a genuine interest in others. This is Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul actually cared about people around him. He cared about the relationships around him, even the differences in people. It did not bother Paul. It, it was attraction to Paul. Philippians chapter 2, verse 19, it says, Now I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be encouraged by the news about you. And so, so when you look at Paul, you realize that Paul was compassionate, he was a caring person, and he genuinely cared about, about people. Fact is, as a pastor, Paul cared if people in his church were getting along. There were several times when people were in conflict within his church, and he's like begging them to please find understanding, please find forgiveness of one another. And so Paul comes to this place, and he's, he, he's away from the church in Philippi. He's in Rome. He sends Timothy back to find out how they're, they're, they're doing. And, and when you look at Paul, Paul cared about that other church. And he could, have, he could have kept Timothy with him. He could have said, you know what, I need Timothy. I'm in a low point in my life. But, but Paul wanted to send Timothy back to that church and bring a report back so he could find out how the church is doing because Paul would say that would cheer him up because Paul cared deeply for the church. You know how it is when you have like a a long distance relative or, or someone that lives far away and they're going to the doctor, they're going to get a doctor's report and you cannot wait. You cannot wait for the phone to ring for you find out how's dad or how's mom. I still remember when my dad was going through bladder cancer and I knew when he was going to the doctor and I knew when he was having a follow up and I, I could not wait for my phone just to light up 
so that I could find out how is, how is dad and how is dad doing. See, this was Paul. Paul was concerned about this local church. So in, in, instead of keeping Timothy with him, that probably would have personally benefited him, he sent Timothy to Philippi because in those days there, there was no Facebook. There was, there was no text, phone calls, or anything like that. The only way he could find out is to send Timothy and have Timothy bring back the news. Philippians 2.3 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, consider others as more important than yourselves. Paul is saying that we not only look on, on our interest, but we should be concerned about the interest of others. It's not shocking to me when you look through Scripture and the hundreds of names that Paul has listed that meant something to, to him in his, his life, that he had that type of relationships. Because when you look at Paul's life, Paul cared about the people around him. Paul cared about their relationships, and Paul cared about their situations in, in life. And there's two positive things that I could come, out, come up with, that when you're that type of person, when you care about the needs of others, and not only your needs, one thing that can come out, come out is it can help you forget the problems that you're walking through. It can help div divert the pain. I, I, I'll never forget uh, five or six years ago, we had a, we had a prayer partner, and, um, and her daughter was diagnosed with a, with a brain tumor. And they'd gone through a couple of surgeries and chemo and their midst of radiation, and, and uh, she came to worship on a weekend, and she wasn't signed up to be a prayer partner that weekend. She just came to worship because she, des she desperately just needed to worship. And she comes to worship, and, and we had one of those weekends to where it was just like a flood of people responding. And then Luke Hart was the coordinator that day. And Luke looked at this prayer partner that had the weekend off in motion to her and says, could you come down? And so she, she begins walking down, and Luke introduces, introduces her to a mother and, a, and, a, and her daughter, which her daughter was about the same age as the prayer partner's daughter, and says, would you mind praying with them? And she said, sure. And the daughter looks at the prayer partner and says, I've just been diagnosed with a brain tumor. The doctors have given me six months. I don't really need you to pray for me. Pray for my mom. My mom's really struggling. And this prayer partner was struggling. Same issue. She prayed for her. And the prayer partner would say there was something that happened. God ministered to me in that moment to be able to pray for somebody else that's going through the exact thing. Only God, only God would plan that. To pray for a, another individual. It's interesting, Dr. Carl Menninger, who is a psychologist, a Christian psychologist, was asked one time, said that if you were ever depressed or you, you're ever about ready to have a mental breakdown, what would, what would be your recommendation? And they were expecting him to say therapy or drugs or something. And Carl looked at him and said, well, that's easy. I would tell you to go out and find someone in need and help them. A lot of times the reason it's hard for us to find the goodness of the Lord and land of the living, the goodness of the Lord and the life that we're actually living it's because we never get outside of ourselves and try to minister and try to help somebody to understand that, guess what, someone else is struggling to. You're not in this alone. When you look at Paul's life, Paul had that type of a life. Paul had, I mean, Paul is in prison. Two years he's going to be there. He's, he's going to end up with his execution. And Paul still cared about the needs of everybody else. Paul never made life about himself. He always, he always turned it... Look, turned it back because he understood scripture look at Isaiah 58 10 says and if you if you offer yourself to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted one then your light will shine in the darkness and your night will become like noonday and the Lord will always lead you satisfy you in a parched land and strengthen your bones so look at this so you will be like a watered garden this confirms what Dr. Menninger said right this confirms that when you come to that place and life is not all about you and your problems are not all about you, 
that you're able to get out and try to help someone in need and try to minister to someone in need, another positive that I could come up with, your friends will reinforce you in a time of need. I've seen that happen over and over in the local church to where, where people that have reached out and people that have ha- helped others, and then when, when they went through the valley, when they went through the valley, all of a sudden people are showing up in emergency rooms and hospital rooms and, and showing up at their house with a meal and all of these other things. Why? Because they had built this relationship. They had been helped in a time of need. Proverbs 17, 17 says, a friend loves at all times, in the valley and out of the valley. But a brother is born in, in for a difficult time. If, listen, I'm telling you, if you want to handle the valley, you do not have to go through the valley of long. For sure, God is with you. But intimate, close friends can be with you as well. The second principle, if you want to develop healthy relationships, is offer sincere encouragement to others. Be willing to offer, and that, that word sincere is important, but be willing to offer sincere encouragement to others. Philippians 2.20 says, For I have no one else like-minded who will genuinely care about your interests. You know what Paul's saying? Paul's saying, I have no one else like Timothy. Timothy is an intimate friend. Timothy is that intimate friend that many times it takes a lifetime to develop to where you have that intimate friend that knows your shadow side, that knows your difficult side, your good side. They've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly, and guess what? They still love you. They still accept you. And you have seen their good, bad, and ugly side, and you, you accept them, and you've built this relationship. Paul only had two at the end of his life. He only had two, Timothy and, and Epiphanes. And so when... And so when you look at this, you you look at Timothy, and Paul is saying, I have no one else like Timothy, and he uses this word, like-minded. It's a fascinating word in the the New Testament. In the Greek, it it really means um, knitted together. It 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 means one soul. It just literally means one soul. And Paul and Timothy possess this relationship, and it's said in the Old Testament. You can go to David and Jonathan, right, in the Old Testament. And, and, and they, had, they had this relationship. They had this deep relationship. They, they, they said a little bit different. They said that their, their, their soul was, was knitted together. Scripture says that Jonathan said of David that he said, I loved him as I, as I love myself. And you can have casual friends and you can have a lot of friends. But I'm telling you, you are blessed if you've worked over a lifetime to develop that intimate, same-souled friend in your life. You're blessed when you have that knitted together, that same-souled or that like-minded soul when it's, a, your, hus- when it's, when it's your spouse, whether it's a husband or, 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 or your wife. And Paul had Timothy. And as a result of that, of that it relieved the pressure off the stress that he's going through in life. Philippians 2, 20 and, and, and verse 21. It says, For I have no one else like-minded who will genuinely care about your interest. That's a rare friend. That's a rare friend. All seek their own interest, but not those of Jesus Christ. Is What he's saying, Paul's saying, Timothy, there's no one in the world like you. You're genuinely concerned about my welfare. Timothy, you're not on an ego trip. You're not on a power trip. You care. You genuinely care. One of the most demeaning things that you can do to someone is talk down to them or criticize them, make fun of them, mock them. You know, I've learned in life that that people may forget the words or the comments that, that you use but they will never forget how you made them feel. They will never forget that emotion. Philippians 2.22 says, "But but you know his proven character because he has served with me in the gospel ministry like a a son with a father. You know what Paul's saying? Paul's saying Timothy is is dependable. He's a servant. I mean, if you want to If you want to deepen relationships, learn to be an encourager. 
It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean flattery. You, know, people, you don't tell people what they want to hear all the time. I mean, if you tell someone that they look marvelous every day and they know they've had some, some bad hair days, <laughs> they're going to come to the place to think, not believe you, right? If you tell people they're awesome every day, they're probably going to come to the place where it gets old and they're going to question whether you're really telling the truth. So, so flattery, listen, flattery is not an encouragement. And it can be disgusting. Slander is saying something behind a person's back that you would never say to their face. And flattery is saying something to a person's face that you would never say behind their back. And so you have to learn in these relationships to be honest. Genuine encouragement, what Paul is talking about with Timothy, has to be backed up with honesty and, and sometimes with correct. Uh, correction and sometimes with truth and sometimes in checking someone's attitudes or, or someone's action and so you learn listen you learn to be an encourager when someone gets promoted you encourage them if someone is facing a challenge and doesn't know if they can make it and make it through the the wilderness then you go and tell them you know what you can face this I know you I know your relationship with the Lord I've walked with you I know you you can do this if someone in your church is hurting then you let them know that guess what I am praying for you and I care about you, and I'll do anything I can to, to help you. Proverbs 12, 25 says, Anxiety in a person's heart weighs it down, but a good word cheers it up. And you want to cheer someone up? Give them a good word. Give them an honest word. I'll never forget. Many years ago, and I, I don't remember when it was tw if it was 2016 or 2018, when we started life journaling here. And so, I mean, we, it was, I mean, it, it was, it, we were all in. And so we're encouraging everybody to life journal, and life groups are life journaling, and, and, and ministry teams are life journaling. It's just simply reading through the scriptures uh, in a year and then doing scripture observation, application, and prayer. We had these two men in our church, and they were younger men, and, and so they decided, you know what, we're taking the challenge. And so we're going we're gonna to life journal together. Every morning at 6 o'clock, they would call each other on the phone, on their cells, on their way to work, and they would, they would, life, they would life journal together. This one morning, they called each other and shared their life journaling verses and, and clicked the phone and off and headed, headed on to work. And about a, about a couple of hours later, all of a sudden, one of the friend's phone lit up and he answered it. And it was his friend's wife who they had just life journaled together. And she says, honey, I hate to tell you, Brian, is, he's died in a tragic car accident few hours after you guys had talked. I did Brian's funeral. I'll never forget it. I, I, I did Brian's funeral. I opened the funeral. I thanked everybody for coming. I read out of the 23rd Psalm. I prayed, and I said, and his buddy is going to do the eulogy. I didn't know anything about this story at this point. And I said, his, his buddy is going to do the unit, eulogy. And I went back, and they had a chair for me, and I'm sitting right back there. His buddy comes up, and he's pretty emotional. He unfolds this like this piece of paper, and he says, Brian and I, for the last year, have life journaled together every morning. Both of us had a lot of temptation in our life. We had a lot of challenges, and so we just needed every day. And he said, um, after we life journaled together, a couple hours later, later, Brian lost his life. And I'm so encouraged by our last life journaling moment together. I, he said, I asked his wife to Xerox out his life journaling moment, and, and he read it. This is what he read. He said, Brian, scripture was, see to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the, the living God. And he said, then Brian wrote these words of his observation. He said, our hearts turn away from God for many reasons. Yet he is always there awaiting our return. We need to make certain that we find ways to return to him instead of taking for granted that he will always be there. If we spend too much time and focus on our sin, we will be left in it and our hearts will become unbelieving. His application, he said, I, I, I want to stay in fellowship with my supports, that's what they called each other, and maintain full focus on my Savior in all I do every minute of every day. I'll remain aware of sin by staying engaged in Scripture, keeping my eyes and heart open to God's instruction, and talking to my friend. His prayer 
Thank you, Lord, for my ability to discern and choose you. I choose you. But I need help watching for temptation of sin and unbelief. Surround me with your angels and keep my mind and heart focused on your word in all I do. Help me to encourage others in love and concern in all I say. Thank you for my friend. You want to have friends, you want to have close friends. It takes time, and it's really hard for men, especially in this in- issue of like intimate, close friends. We'll be honest and transparent. I, I really like the word knitted together, because that, I'm not a knitter, <laughs> but I've been around a few, my mom. Knitting takes time. He didn't say glued together. He didn't say microwaved. He didn't say welded. He didn't say instant. Knitted together. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes time, Hebrews 3.13. Be encouraged each other daily. What is still called today. So that none of you is hardened by sin's deception. Third principle, if you want to develop healthy friends, is this, practice unselfish release of people. And like I say, three and four are almost, I could have made it three points instead of four. I chose four, but one bleeds right into the other. Philippians 2.25, but I considered it necessary to send Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, fellow soldier, as well as your messenger and minister uh, to my need. And so there's just a little bit of a backstory. It's an intriguing story about Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus had been sent to Paul. So, so Epaphroditus was in the church in Philippi. Paul's in Rome. So they send Epaphroditus. They say, you go because you, there's, there's no phones. You go, to, you go to Rome. You talk to Paul because we're worried about him. And then you come back to the church in, in Philippi and you give us a report. Well, when, by the time Epaphroditus gets to Rome, he's, he's like almost dead. I mean, he, he's, he's, on his, he's on his deathbed. And, uh, and he recovered, but word got back to Philippi that, that Epaphroditus was deathly ill, and Epaph- Epaphroditus may have passed away. And so Epaphroditus was concerned about his family. He was concerned about his church. He was concerned about his friends. He desperately, he desperately wanted to go back to Philippi, but he was sent to help Timothy, I mean, to help Paul. And so he didn't want to let Paul down. He didn't want to hurt Paul. He didn't want people to think he was a quitter. Um, but, but Epaphroditus came to that place, you know what, do what God has called you to do and, 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 and don't worry about what other people think. And so Epaphroditus goes to Paul and says, Paul, I really want to go home. I think that's what the Lord would have me to do. And uh, I think I need to give him a report that I'm, I'm okay. And then Paul cared so much about Epaphroditus because Paul, Paul cared about the interests of others and the interest of, of his church. And Paul could have said, you know what, Timothy isn't here. Um, I don't have anyone to help me. Who's going to support me? These Roman guards, what are you, what are you doing? And he, he releases, he releases Epaphroditus. Not only that, he was so concerned about Epaphroditus, he wrote a section of scripture so that people believed the best and didn't criticize him. Here's what he writes, Philippians chapter 2, verse 26. He said, since he has been longing for all of you and was distressed because you heard that he was sick, indeed he was so sick that he nearly died. However, God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. For this reason, I am eager to send him so that you may rejoice again when you see him, I, and I may, may be less anxious. Therefore, welcome him in the Lord with great joy. Don't criticize him. He didn't leave me. I sent him. And hold people like him in honor because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up what what was lacking in your ministry to me. And that leads us to the fourth and last principle. Learn to give people freedom. So many times we are so quick to criticize. And we are so quick to judge. And we're quick to judge people's motives. Or we're quick to judge people's actions. And learn to come to this place where we just give people freedom. It would have been easy for Paul to say, you know, Epaphroditus, you want to go home? You're, you're, you're leaving me here all alone. And could have criticized him. And as a result of that, 
Paul was willing. Paul was willing to give, give him space. In other words, Paul trusted in the Lord ultimately, and he, he handled friends not in a controlling, manipulating, judgmental way, but he handled his friends loosely, giving them space to mature in Christ, giving them space maybe to make some mistakes, maybe to learn some things without guilt or without judgment. And so Paul, listen, Paul was this guy that trusted so much in God, and he would give people freedom. That, that he held people loosely. See, Paul didn't make his friends like tiptoe around the issue or tiptoe around him and, and word that he was going to, you know, scripture them or judge them or say something harsh to them or anything like that. Paul didn't pout when he got hurt or remove his relationships or move his friendships. I mean, when he looked at Epaphroditus and said, Epaphroditus, you feel like God wants you to go home and you feel like your family needs that? I'm, I'm, I'm going to support you. Maybe that was why Paul had such a magnetic personality. Maybe that's why Paul, people love Paul. I mean, listen, I'm telling you, when you look at this knitted together, when you look at that word, you make friends at this level slowly over time. To develop friendships and relationships like this of deep trust, it is not quick. Trust has to be built on both sides. Work slowly so trust is developed. And you know, you know they're mature. I mean, this applies, this, is, this applies in so many areas. This applies like in, in, in dating and like single. And you know what? Quit looking for the instant relationships. Quit looking for Mr. Right Now. Come to the place to where you build relationships with one another. And you build trust with one another. Be satisfied with some casual relationships as you build trust and you learn their emotion and their maturity and some of those other things. But at the same time, not being a leech just hanging on, de de demanding that your friends just include you in everything. And if they leave you out of one thing, don't get upset. Understand, hold your friends loosely. Because if you handle relationships like that, you won't grow your relationship. You'll shrink them. And so this applies, listen, especially in the season of life that I am in with adult children out of the house and grandkids and some of those other things. This applies to parents as well of adult children. When they live home, leave home, the hardest transition I made is moving from a parent to a child relationship to adult to adult relationship. Learning to, learning to give them space. And it takes time. You have to learn to let them go, and you have to learn to let them and allow them to, to make their decisions and live their dreams and, and move away and follow God and go on mission trips, adopt a child and, and make financial decisions and buy a house and take that promotion, deny that promotion or take a job and, and, and come, over, um, come over whenever they want to see you. Might be the hard one. If not, they may feel obligated and guilty and resentful one day. You have to give them a healthy release. And listen, I've made plenty of mistakes in this transition, and I've worked hard to develop adult-to-adult -adult relationships to where they're free to to come and go, and even when they come, if they want to come, go and see their friends and, and understand that, and, and you know, allow them to, to come over whenever they want to or, or when they run out of money and just need a free meal. <laughs> and don't manipulate them, and, 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 and if they don't do what you want, all of a sudden they're in trouble. I mean, Brittany, our, our oldest daughter, they, they live in, in Colorado Springs, and and instead of driving down to Pueblo where they can hear amazing worship and okay preaching, <laughs> come to lunch afterwards at our house, they've made a decision to go to a church in the Springs. And, and I could have the temptation to give them some guilt, manipulate them, and let them know that, guess what? People come to this church from Colorado Springs to Rye, Col from Rye, Colorado City, Cotopaxi, La Junta, Lamar, uh, the mountains. I mean, they... In case you don't know, people drive great distances to come to this church. And I could, I, could, I could do that. But it's their choice, right? It's their choice to go to any church they want to go to. And it's my choice to cut them out of the wheel. And so, uh, 
But there's that, there's that, you know, for all of you that are in my season of life, there's that temptation, right? I mean, there's that temptation. But, but, you know, it's interesting. We have policemen that curve the effects of hate. But there's no one to protect us from those who sometimes just smother us with love. And they don't give us the freedom to make choices. And they don't hold people around them loosely. And you want to hold on, but you have to, listen, you have to, you have to learn and let them go. And that way, when they come down the driveway to see you, guess what? You know they want to they wanna, wanna see you. If you want to have real friends, if you want to develop those close friends, you have to take a genuine interest in other people. And you have to get your mind off of yourself, and you give them space. 2 Timothy 4.16, here's what it says. A few years later, Paul's in prison, and, and his friends aren't there this time. And here's what he writes. He says, 2 Timothy 4.16, At my first defense, no one stood by me, but everyone deserted me. Man, not be counted against them. What an emotional, emotionally mature man. And we don't know what happened to their friends. We don't know if some were martyred for their faith. If some had gotten sick and died, if some of them were in in prison for their faith, we, we just don't know. We don't know. But what an emotionally mature individual, Paul, whose trust, you're going to see it when we read this next verse, whose trust was ultimately in the Lord, then people. In verse 17, but the, but the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that I might fully preach the word and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. You know what this tells me? You better have more than just friends. Because as close as your friends are, people fail, people quit, people give up, people get busy, people get transferred away, people people die. What the scripture says, there's one friend that will never leave you. There is one friend who always stays faithful. There is one friend who will live forever. And his name is Jesus Christ. Proverbs 18.24 says, One with many friends may be harmed, but there is a friend who stays closer than a brother. Paul would say, ultimately you need a relationship with Jesus Christ. And out of that is how you develop your friends and how you develop your relationships. And it was with that that we take communion. And we're reminded that we have a a friend who is closer than a brother. A friend who will always be with you. His name is Jesus Christ and the scripture says before he before he went to the cross he gathered with the disciples and it says on the night that he was betrayed he took bread he broke it he blessed it He said take and eat this this is for you would you just just bow your heads with me just for a second Let me just lead you into just a moment of prayer, personal prayer for you. You can pray silently. You don't have to need to pray out loud. But the scripture says before we take of the bread and we take of the juice, that we should examine our side, ourselves, we examine our, our lives. Is there sin you need to confess? Is there something that you need to confess before him? And it's just agreeing with the Lord that this is sin, that that was wrong. Do you just need to remember one thing where you saw the goodness of the Lord in the life that you're actually living this last week? Whether it was the encouraging word of a friend or an answer to prayer, 
something that you read in Scripture, something that happened that you know only God could have done that, just something that you're grateful for, something that you're thankful for. In worship, we uh, talked about filling a cup. Maybe you stumbled in here this evening and you would say emotionally your cup is empty for whatever, for whatever reason. Maybe you would just ask him, would you fill my cup? Would you encourage me? Would I be reminded that you are here with me? And I'm surrounded with brothers and sisters in, in Christ. And I'm in this alone. Maybe you have a prayer request. God, would you do this for me? Scripture says on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread, he, he blessed it, he broke it. He said, take, this is my body, which is for you. And there is a person that stays closer to me and closer to you than a brother. Father, as we take of this bread, may we be reminded of your love for us. May we be reminded what you did for us on the cross that gives us forgiveness of sin and, and freedom. For we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Would you take of the bread with me? Scripture goes on and says that after supper, Jesus took the cup. He said, in this cup is, the, is my blood, the new covenant. And do this again. Do this in remembrance of me. And as often as you eat of the bread, you drink of the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It's also a reminder, Proverbs 18, 24, that you have a, a person that sticks closer to you than a brother. Father, as we take of the juice, may we know that we have been totally and completely forgiven and that we're deeply loved in you, by you. And Lord, we just thank you that on this earth you were, you were perfect but you cared for our interest above yours. It was in the garden, the garden of Gethsemane. You said, not my will, but your will. May the will of my Father be done. As a result of that, you went to the cross, and you were crucified, and you rose again on the third day for the forgiveness of our sin. And so we thank you for that this night. For we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Would you take the juice with me? Would you bow your heads with me and close your eyes? Let me, let me ask you, what is, what is God saying to your result of this message? More importantly, what is your next step? Whatever he spoke into your life, would you just be obedient and take that next step. Maybe you're here tonight and say, you know, I just need someone to pray for me. I just need someone to encourage me and add their faith to my faith. It's a medical issue, a financial issue, a relational issue. Maybe you're trying to discern the will of the Father and something to do. Maybe you want to celebrate something. Maybe what you're carrying has nothing to do with what I just talked about, or maybe it does. Whatever it is, if you need prayer this evening, as I pray in just a few minutes, we're going to stand. Would you stand with us in a few moments? Step out, begin making your way down to the front. We're not going to be in this moment long. There's something for every one of us to do, whether we're standing 
and praying either for ourselves or those who are responding, we're responding. But if you need prayer, you come after I pray and we stand. Father, we thank you for your love and your grace. Holy Spirit, would you draw this church very close to you, to you and may we respond to you tonight. For we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me, please? And then as you stand, just real quickly, if you have a prayer request, if you're carrying a burden, if you just need someone to pray for you, we would love to have the honor and the privilege to pray for you. Would you make your way down to the front? All you have to do is just tell us your name and how we can pray for you. And we'd love to have the opportunity to pray for you, to encourage you. We have story after story, what God has done in the front of this room when people have just humbled themselves and prayed. Um, you don't have to go through all the details. Just tell us your name and how we can pray for you. We'd love to pray for you. We'd love to encourage you. You can come individually. You can bring a friend. You can bring a spouse, a family. It does not matter to us. But if you need prayer, you just make your way down the front. We'll guide you. We'll direct you. Tell us your name and how we can pray for you. And we'd love to have the honor and the privilege. And I mean that. It's an honor and a privilege to pray for you. If you'd like to connect with us, you can connect with us through the, the connect cards on the seat back in front of you, whether you'd like to f uh, follow the Lord and Believer's baptism, you'd like to get in a life group or have an interest uh, in what's going on here or meet with a pastor, you, you can indicate that in the connect card. And so you can do it old school, pen and paper and put them in the boxes on the way out, or you can grab the QR code, it's gonna come up on the screen or on the seat back, and you can do it electronically uh, as well. And then that'll get to us and we'll respond to you. And now for our, our benediction. And may you receive this as a word of the Lord for you. May it encourage you. May the Lord bless you. And may the Lord protect you. And may the Lord make his face shine on you. And may the Lord just be gracious to you. And this week, may the Lord give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God bless you, and thank you for being here this evening.